This uh, talk really arises out of a project which is a collaboration with the University College London with Professor Sally Price in the um, uh, um, oh, shouldn't get this working right. uh, in the uh, Crystal Structure Prediction Project. Okay, so the uh, the idea here is um, what the, the aim of the project is to do the most accurate possible prediction of the ground state structure of molecular crystals. And here's an example of one of the ones we've been working on, which is uh, cyhectamide. Um, so you know, there are three crystalline polymorphs here, and it's a molecular organic crystal, so the molecules are identical. There's no confirmation, no real significant confirmation change, uh, but the hydrogen bonding does change between the polymorphs. Um, a few things to point out about this, these are very large crystal structures, the smallest one is 132, the other have 264 atoms, and uh, the uh, relative energies there, of course because the molecules are intact, the relative energies are very, very similar, the molecular energy doesn't change, a lot of this is in the bonding energy. So we've been doing the calculations with CASTEP using various uh, dispersion corrected PBE functionals, for, for better or for worse. Um, but it's clear that the energy difference is insufficient to, to, to uh, establish stability. What we need is the free energy difference. Uh, we need to include the zero point energy, which is really quite large here. So the zero point energy of form one is 7.305. Uh, zero point energy of form three is 7.301. So we have four milli EV um, per molecule. This is per molecule um, uh, difference in the uh, uh, zero point energy. Right, so my page, this is not working as a pager. Um, so, a little word about phonons. Um, so, essentially, one of the lovely things about having a very uh, uh, high throughput DFT type calculation is that we can uh, uh, calculate the phonons, which we do by a complete parameterization of a, essentially a ball and spring model of the crystal. Um, the model is misleading only in really in the respect that the springs connect not just neighbor atoms as shown in the picture, but they connect all pairs of atoms in our crystal. Uh, so what we gain using the, either density perturb functional perturbation theory or using a finite displacement uh, uh, central difference uh, technique is this force matrix of force constants, which is a second derivative of energy between, uh, uh, depending on the displacement of one atom and, an, and the second atom. And knowing this, this object, this force constant matrix, we can Fourier transform it to get the dynamical matrix at any particular plane wave vector, which is a 3n by 3n object. And uh, then we can find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the frequencies are the squares, uh, the frequencies are the square roots of the eigenvectors. And that's how we get phonon dispersion curves. The calculations that, uh, well, I'll say a bit more about the calculations in a moment. I want to point out a couple of important things. There is a sum rule uh, on this force constant matrix, which means that if I sum, sum the forces, if I displace an atom here, there's a strong restoring force, right? So there's a force constant, the on-site force constant is very large. There's also a force on all of the other atoms, so all of the off-site force constants are much smaller, and it, but they must sum to zero. That's what guarantees the uh, acoustic modes go to zero at zero frequency. Um, so the acoustic modes arise from absolute cancellation of all of these force constants. Now when we do a first principles calculation, we are doing independent SCF calculations of the force constants. So we are uh, uh, attempting to rely on complete cancellation between a whole bunch of independent calculations. So the residual errors and the systematic errors are going to be very important in this. What's even more important is that when we look at the deviation away from zero here, when we look at the modes at slightly non-zero Q, or we look at uh, uh, optic phonon modes, we get a, these result from an almost complete cancellation of this. So the cancellation is not just a quirk for the gamma point uh, acoustic modes, it, the behavior near there is, is something that we are not capturing, uh, we're not building in essentially into our lattice dynamics, we're hoping it results from doing the calculations to a high enough precision. 
And there's an extraordinary sensitivity here because the frequencies are the square roots of the eigenvalues. And so they are extraordinarily sensitive to numerical precision error. Let me give you an example which I like to use as a rule of thumb. Consider a hydrogen atom bonded to an oxygen. The vibra OH vibrational frequency is 3,600 wave numbers, but in a molecular crystal, an, in an int intermolecular mode might be 10 wave numbers. And the same hydrogen is moving. So the ratio of the frequencies is 360 to 1, which gives you a ratio of the force con effective force constants of 130,000 to 1. So if we're going to capture this external mode to a precision of even one part in 10, we'll need a precision of better than one part in a million on the other force constant. So, we, so not only do we need to compute these force constants to cancel, we need, to, we, we need them to cancel to one part in a million to do this kind of calculation fully. How do they actually look? So this is not a molecular crystal. This is niobium, which is uh, one atom per unit cell. Um, uh, here's the on-site force constant, about 10 to the minus 1. I've plotted the force constants on the logarithmic scale as a function of distance from the central atom. Uh, so there's a whole bunch at about 10 to the minus 2, then 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. Uh, and what I've shown here is the effect of discarding force constants below the cutoff. So if you discard force constants smaller than 10 to the minus 3, you can see that we have uh, uh, perturbed the uh, uh, acoustic dispersion by quite a large amount. Uh, by the time we get to 10 to the minus 4, it's looking reasonable, and 10 to the minus 5, uh, we're, we're capturing the lattice dynamics. So, so we, you know, we can cut off here, but there's a whole range of force constants here which still have to cancel in order to uh, calculate the phonons spectrum accurately. And when you do this for uh, one of these large molecular crystals, so this is uh, cyheptamide, um, uh, done with castet, uh, done with uh, a finite displacement supercell method for uh, various reasons which uh, I, I don't, are not interesting enough to go into uh, at the moment. Um, you'll see that we have an excursion below zero there. And I think everybody who has done phonon calculations will have observed such a, a phenomenon here. So how do we calculate the free energy from that? Well, this is a complete and utter disaster, isn't it? Because here's our formula for our vibrational free energy. It's the integral of the phonon density of states times log 1 minus x, this Boltzmann factor. So as the frequency goes to zero, exponential goes to one, the argument of the logarithm goes to zero. So the logarithm diverges, the free energy diverges. What can we do? I've seen calculations in the literature which simply discard these modes, okay? And what you're doing if you do that is not discarding the small components to be ignored, you're discarding the very largest contributions to the free energy because it's the low frequency modes because of this logarithmic term they contribute the largest vibrational entropy. So this is what you m want to know most and what, it's, what you can find out. Uh, it's the most difficult to find out numerically. So what are the origins of, these, uh, of, of this, this uh, excursion of the acoustic branch below zero? Well, pretty much any kind of underconvergence can cause that. Um, basis set, electronic k-point sampling, uh, auxiliary FFT grid, I'll show you some results on that. Uh, incompleteness of the geometry optimization, which is horribly easy to do when you don't have a nice uh, regular material parabolic energy surface. Molecular crystals are much more awkward. SCF convergence, the residual error in the forces. Uh, supercell size, dispersion corrections, and uh, still probably, but we're, hopefully we're nearly over pseudo potential error by now. Or it could be real. It could be a genuine instability, which is dynamically stabilized by the vibrational uh, physics, the quantum vibrational physics. So we've been attempting to undertake a systematic uh, study of all of these uh, with the hope of uh, writing uh, a workflow which can be used by researchers in the field to gain reliable numerical results. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk you through basis set and k-point sampling because so there's, there's nothing much I can show anybody else in the, that people in the room don't know already. What I thought would, might be a bit more of a surprise is the um, uh, grid and, uh, uh, and SCF convergence. So this is this, this cyheptamide. Um, this number here is the SCF energy 
criterion in electron volts per atom. So when I converge to 10 to the minus 10 EV per atom, I get imaginary modes. 10 to the minus 11, uh, they, they, they become positive, but there's still a shift up to, down to about 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 13. Right? That's near machine precision. So we just got away with it here in machine by doing our SCF convergence to machine precision, but only just. So maybe we're going to have to do calculations to better than machine precision in order to do that. Um, and that's not as hard as you, it might sound. The other feature I want to draw your attention to here is the effect of the auxiliary grid for the density. This is using ultra soft pseudo potentials. The potentials are moving across the grid. There is an egg box effect contributing spurious forces. And so if we turn up the grid, this is, this is a, a grid scale. So it's the ratio of, of, G, uh, of the G max of the um, uh, density grid to the uh, half the G max of the sorry, to the Gmax of the orbital cutoff. Uh, so uh, up, we have to go up to uh, uh, four, or f uh, four or five in order to uh, converge this out. So this is another important uh, convergence issue. Um, another issue is the effect of supercell size. When we do any kind of DF, uh, lattice dynamics calculation, we are effectively calculating not of the, this force constant matrix, which is a, an aperiodic object, but we're calculating a dynamical matrix of a, in a supercell, which is a periodic object. So we have in, uh, if the supercell is not large enough, we will essentially overlap the tails of these and get aliasing errors. And the effect of this can be seen here. So we have to converge that out. And you'll notice, by the way, there's a good example here of good practice in convergence, which is going up from 1 by 2 by 2, 2 by 2 by 1, uh, 2 by 3 by 1 cell. It seems to, to have improved here, 2 by 2 by 1, but it gets worse again. So the idea of convergence, of course, is to stop when the result stops changing and not when you get the result that you want. Uh, coronine is a pretty pathological example here because uh, uh, it's this great big rigid molecule. So if you push one side of it, the other side moves. So the force constant matrix is very long range within the molecule and only falls off when, you, when it comes to the uh, in, uh, intermolecular gap here. So we have some is uh, con long range convergence issues with this rigid flat planar molecule. Um, but we have pushed this enough to do the free energy. This is a different molecule, which is kind of like this cyheptamide, but with an extra group on there. Uh, so this is desloradatine. Uh, and we can compare the free energies of polymorphs. So form mm. one has, uh, uh, is, is, is renormalized to zero. And form three, the free, uh, there should be a phase transition to form three somewhere about 360 Kelvin. So we can calculate the free energies to the, to, to the kilojoule per mole accuracy, to, <laughs> to, to chemical accuracy, only by pushing this whole suite of uh, convergence factors very hard. And I really just skimmed over how we did it. I want to take a moment to talk about accuracy, not precision. How accurate are we? Now, if we want to look at the uh, phonon dispersions of molecular crystals, there's remarkably little data in the literature. Um, I had to go back 25 years to find this one. Uh, in fact, the data set was, was taken in part by my PhD supervisor um, uh, quite a long time ago, uh, using inelastic neutron scattering. So the warning here is that uh, this is PBE plus dispersion correction, and I've compared the tachenko scheffler pairwise version with the latest many-body dispersion uh, revised version, the MBD star. And you can see that there are really substantial differences, uh, but again, differences from experiment. Um, and, and if I was to do uh, uh, DF2 or something like that, um, which I don't have the capability of here, that would again be different from here. So these van der Waals correction functionals are really not giving you uh, a, con uh, a result consistent between them. So we, we do, uh, and, um, and I would posit that these are inadequately tested for vibrational properties. They weren't designed for that. Uh, they haven't been properly benchmarked yet. So uh, uh, I think my answer to the question is uh, on, on, the, on the exit, uh, exit slip is to say we need to benchmark uh, 
density, uh, Van der Waals corrections for vibrational properties. So to conclude, we can do vibrational free energy calculations for molecular crystals, but they tax the limits of precision that we can achieve. We need to push everything as far as we can get. And we may need to converge our SCF to better than machine precision. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if the, we're used to thinking about an exit criterion for an SCF loop, uh, with using energy as a proxy for the convergence. But actually, maybe we're going to need to converge on the residuals of the density or the orbitals instead in order to, uh, and, and, uh, and that's what I mean by better than machine precision. We won't get an improvement in the energy number, but that's a proxy for what we really care about is, is the convergence of the density and the orbitals. Um, just about anything you can under-converge will mess up this calculation. So you have to get it all right. You have to, every time. And, and uh, uh, so the, the, the goal of this is to try to establish a workflow pro, uh, protocol uh, uh, for researchers who are not DFT experts. So thank you very much.